Dot. High noon. Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the first of a three-part series here at Curious Health. We're putting on a summer webinar series, and we want to discuss a couple of hot topics of the day, and one of them is medication. And today's presentation is going to talk about the high cost of medication today and exactly how we get to those prices. So I, I just saw a stat last night. It was late news. Um, they said that the average household in America, okay, it's averages, so you're going to have your, your outliers one way or the other, but the average household spends $20,000 in out-of-pocket expenses for health care every single year. And, and no wonder why, you know, we're, most of us are one really bad diagnosis away from bankruptcy. And I saw another stat that uh, close to 80% of patients that are diagnosed with some sort of terminal cancer do go bankrupt before they pass away. And that's just an alarming statistic. It was scary to think about that. And um, so, but, but either way, though, we're really excited to have you all on, on the webinar. And at the end, if we have time, we'll open it up to some dialogue and questions. And also, we'll give you our contact information so you can reach out to us at any time. So let's get started. So here we go. This is our team today. Today's presenters, um, we've got Mark Schlussel, Mr. Esquire. He's our CEO of Curis. Good afternoon, Mark. Gee, I, I like the, my movie credits. I think that's terrific. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the Duke. The Duke. Now, now I feel emboldened. I really appreciate that. And Mark, our CEO, he's got a uh, uh, number of years as a healthcare attorney. And I, like I said, he's our CEO. And next up is Sarah Amaral. She's our physician uh, assistant. She's the chief medical engagement officer for Curis. I remember that picture now, Jared. Yeah, yeah, the <laughs> Olympic tryouts. Yeah, good job, Sarah. <laughs> so she shared with me by mistake one time that she used to be an ice skater. So uh, anyway. That actually really then, looks uh, similar to what my mom has in her scrapbooks. That's that kind of <laughs> Did I scare you? <laughs> so, and then uh, I'm, I'm Jared Mortz. I'm a clinical nurse specialist, advanced practice nurse, and I'm the chief innovation officer here at Curis. So the three of us are going to do the presentation today, and we hope you like it. So welcome. We're excited to have you here. And if you look at our, our text um, thing here, this question mark, how many of you really know what these, these statements are? Uh, what's a WAC? What's, what's PBM? What's a copay? Stop loss carriers, TPA, OTC. These are confusing. And to be honest with you, about two years ago, I didn't even know what half of these were. So what this is, is basically an introduction to all of these parts and pieces that add up to very costly medications. So here we go. Um, something happened on my screen here that I think I want to get rid of here. Hopefully you can't see that. But anyway, we'll just kind of push it over. Okay. So in the news, like I talked about, uh, we know that the president just signed an executive order uh, mandating that healthcare costs is more transparent. Now there wasn't a specific outline on exactly how we're gonna do it, but for him to sign an executive order, we know that, that also we know that the CEOs, and Sarah's gonna talk about this here in a second, but the CEOs from Big Pharma, that's the big pharmaceutical companies that that are, are huge lobbyists that spend millions of dollars on uh, political votes. Uh, they were up in, in Congress uh, on Capitol Hill last month giving testimony. And so were the CEOs and top executives of third party administrators and PBMs. And so that's pretty important when you know that it's a bipartisan outreach for resolution of, of what they call price gouging. And they're looking for innovative ideas uh, to, to help change the way that, that our, our pharmacy medications and healthcare cost. And Curis would like to be that, that solution. So that's in the news. So with that said, uh, Sarah's gonna take us through some actual examples of what Big Pharma has to say. So go ahead, Sarah. Hi everyone, thanks for the great introduction, Jared. As usual, uh, the next few slides give us, in my opinion, they give you kind of a, an idea of the scope of the problem. There's several quotes that you'll be seeing and we'll talk about give you an idea of the inflation of medications. Um, so the, these are from quotes from Big Pharma, which is, as Jared said, the, the top executives at pharmaceutical companies. And these, most of these are quotes that were um, made while these executives were testifying in front of Congress. So Mylan, 
Um, this, this is a company that owns EpiPen. EpiPen is, an, it's epinephrine, it's a medication that is used to treat patients who are having an anaphylactic or life-threatening response to an allergen. And this company reportedly brought in nearly $300 million in compensation between 2011 and 2015. And these payoffs just so happened to coincide to the period when the list prices for EpiPen soared. They increased over 500% in about a decade. And today, EpiPens, which cost Mylan only about $30 to produce, they go for over $600. This is before any coupons or rebates. Um, and that just gives you an idea of their, their profit margins. Sarah, didn't you tell me a story the other day about somebody you knew that had to go overseas? I think that was Mark, actually. Oh, was that Mark? Mark yes, was, uh, there was in traveling with someone. Yeah, one of my grandkids is traveling in a group with another friend, and she has a lot of allergies, and the family had to send her with 12 EpiPens, mm -hmm. which cost them, if you can do the math right now, uh, it cost them over $7,200 for those EpiPens when that number should have been around five or $600 for all those EpiPens. So there's an indication of what has happened with the market being markedly increased uh, simply because they can. Yeah, um, a different pharmaceutical company executive, we, we kind of get a chuckle out of this one. I guess under the pressure, he finally said that his, company his company's recent 400% drug increase was because he felt a moral requirement to sell the product at that highest price. And the, the, what he's implying is he feels that obligation to his shareholders that they should make as much money as possible, um, which you just kind of scratch your head because this, this medication, this nitroferentin, which um, is about $500 per bottle to more than 2,300, this is a medication that is uh, used for lower urinary tract infections. And it's considered essential by the World Health Organization. This medication has a long history of a safe and efficacious, being safe and efficacious. And it's, it's great because it's a class B for pregnancy. So there are no known side effects or risks to the developing fetus or to a, to, to and when you're nursing, it's also safe. And that, and thinking about the implications of that in third world countries where you can't always, you, you, they, maybe they don't know if they're, it's, it's death. this is a great medication for third world countries and to know that it's costing this much, it's just, um, it, you know, you can see the juxtaposition, the morals where somebody's thinking about their being, you know, following more their morals and maybe they're, they're different than other people's. <laughs> um, so Merck, I think we've all heard, heard this company before this, there's, in response to a question from a senator, Kenneth Frazier from Merck admitted that patients with no insurance are the ones who pay the list price, and the people who can least afford it are paying the most. Merck is happy to blame this on rebates they pay to PBMs, which we'll define shortly, and insurers. Um, but they have their medications for certain, certain of their medications for diabetes, cancer, and stroke have risen in cost between 25 and 40 percent just in the last year. Um, and again, we've included that the adverse selected and underserved are charged the most. It's not a surprise, but um, it doesn't uh, lessen the impact to, to know that it just doesn't sound right. And uh, our, our final, um, the final example that I have here is about a, a steroid. I think it's on the next slide. It's this steroid called Deflazacort. Um, this is a steroid that's been approved for treating kids with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy has fewer side effects than existing steroids. So it's really a necessity for these patients that have been afflicted with this disease. And many patients are able to get it from Europe or Canada for between $1,000 and $2,000 a year. But in the United States, this company in Deerfield, Illinois has um, gotten approval from the FDA to sell it. And it's list price $89,000 right now, which is a $6,000 price increase. And they're, I mean, it, this, what we suppose is they're capitalizing on the fact that there is no other comparable medication and that these parents will do anything to get this medication for their children. So I, I, all these slides have kind of demonstrated the same thing um, about the problem or giving you an idea of what the problem is and, and the scope of the problem. 
And coming up, we'll talk more about why they've gotten so high and even some solutions uh, to this problem. Great job. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. So most people probably don't realize that there's, there's several links of a chain that go from the manufacturer of a drug, such as Pfizer, I'll just throw them out there, but we're not going to we're, we're, not, we're not endorsing or, or putting down any of these pharmaceutical companies. I'm just giving you an example. So Pfizer will put out a medication and that particular medication probably costs a lot of money for them to do research and development over a number of years. Some drugs take lo longer than 10 years to get uh, to where they can get it FDA approved. But anyway, so they want to recoup that cost. It's understandable. <clears throat> but as Sarah just showed, there are several medications that are being grossly overcharged that have already been approved and on the market for years. And I'll give you a couple more examples later if you're already not worried. And so, but it doesn't just go from the pharmaceutical company straight to the pharmacy and in the, in the hands of the consumer. Unfortunately, there's several links in that chain that add cost to the process, okay? And that's what we're gonna go over right now. So we're gonna talk about the cost chain of pharmaceuticals in the United States, from the manufacturing of the drug all the way through the patient putting it in their mouth. And we've got a nice, nice little uh, cartoon to, to top it off here. So defining medication pricing. So when that medication's produced and, and bottled up in the, in the pharmaceutical company and ready to ship out, it's at what we call list price or an actual cost of that medication, okay? And it embedded in that price should be everything that they needed to recoup their profits from the R&D, the manufacturing, the overhead costs, et cetera. So that's the list price, but also known on the market as a wholesale acquisition cost. So what that means is that some supplier like Cardinal Health, for example, they're going to buy for their, as a distributor, they're going to buy an, an, a wholesale. So like you go to Sam's Club and, and I only want one jar of pickles, but unfortunately they sell them in their 32 jars of wholesale. So I got to buy 32 jars of pickles, right? That's an exaggeration, but you get it. So they're going to buy a lot of medications all at once. So they get a whack price. So then that's, that's shipped to the carrier or the supplier, and they're going to hold that drug, okay, and then they're going to go ahead and mark it up because they need to make money. And once they mark it up, then it's, it's acquisition uh, wholesale price, and then they're going to go ahead and sell it to the pharmacies, right, and, and pharmaceutical business. Now, there's a piece of the chain here that's missing, and Mark's going to cover that here in a minute, and it's additional middlemen. Uh, in, in the chain of, of pharmaceuticals. So then the pharmacy is going to hold it and they've got their usual and common prices that also could be marked up and there's no real definition of how much, but it could be anywhere from 10 to 20%, depending on the medication and where the pharmacy uh, is located. So then what does that mean? Well, on the left column there, if you're insured and you've been spending all year long extra money for coinsurance, uh, you have insurance, and, and then you walk in and you make your copay. Uh, usually, it's anywhere from twenty to a hundred bucks, depending. And and you walk out of there, and and you're not one of those that probably spend twenty thousand a year on your health care. However, if you don't pay those additional costs throughout the year for coinsurance, your copay could be much higher, if if one at all. And and then you you're going to pay the insurance price. Um, and then we're going to talk about manufacturers coupons later, but I wanted to throw that in now because what we're paying is not really what the middlemen are paying. So we'll get into that. However, on the right-hand column, if you're uninsured, like Sarah was talking about, the underserved, right? The people that don't have healthcare insurance, <laughs> if they get that prescription and they go to the pharmacy, they're gonna pay list price, okay? And, and if they can't pay list price and it's, let's say a, a chemotherapeutic agent or a really high dollar medication, they may be able to, depending upon who is on their side, contact the manufacturer of the drug and, and get on one of their trial lists and maybe get a discounted price. Um, so, but that discounted price actually is only discounted for that patient if they get accepted. They're still being charged the whole list price and then that comes with, re then the manufacturer gets reimbursed through the federal government for R&D uh, of that medication, if that makes sense. So for clinical trials and whatnot. So the money is still being paid to the, to the pharmaceutical company. It's just through our tax dollars, not that individual patient. So let's give you two examples, okay? And I'll talk about this later. One is a generic drug, okay, on the left. And the other one on the right is a trade drug. Okay, there is no generic yet. And we'll talk more about that. 
atorvastatin. It, it's it's a life saving uh, cholesterol medication. They've been out on the market for decades. They're safe. They're effective. Uh, people will argue they should be in the water. Um, so depending on the manufacturer, atorvastatin used to be known as Liptor. Okay, uh, it's about nine bucks for for a month supply of forty milligram strength. Some people are on 20 milligrams, some people are on 80, but that's an average. So it gives you an idea, nine bucks a month, not bad. Uh, but the listed average wholesale price from the, the pharmaceutical company is $173 for the exact same 30 tabs. And that's a generic, okay? Let's look over on the right-hand column. We have Xarelto, which is a, a antiplatelet blood thinner. Trade only, and for a month's supply, uh, the list price is 419. Then we get the, the wholesale price, which is 503. Pharmacy charge is 522. It's confusing and obviously there's price gouging going on. So here's, here's our cartoon. Uh, the poor guy goes to the pharmacy and he picks up his medication and there you go. So that's uh, kind of what we all feel like sometimes. And, and what are you gonna do? You know, it's your, your health or your wealth. You know, sometimes people, a lot of times people can't afford that prescription medication. They can't refill it. And maybe they have samples they got from the, the doctor's office. But after that, they can't continue to take that medication and think about, you know, their wellness in, in another 10, 20 years and, and their livelihood. Okay. So without further ado, Mark's going to talk about how we can, who the middlemen are and, and perhaps can we cut them out. Thanks very much, Jared. I, I want to make one comment about the uh, the drugs that you just described because I, it's uh, an anecdotal piece, but I think it's interesting. When Xarelto came out, which was a terrific anti-clotting agent, but the reality was that it did not have a uh, clotting agent that you could prescribe if somebody was on Xarelto and they fell and hit their head and ended up having an internal brain bleed, uh, the likelihood was that their life would be in some jeopardy because of that fact. And that wasn't very well known right. as we moved through the process. So people were, uh, doctors were pres prescribing Xarelto, but in fact, uh, the, some of the old drugs in, in the, on the market where there were clotting agents were probably a safer choice in the process. So let's move forward and move the, uh, to the middleman review and uh, uh, with a slide uh, that we, if we take a look at the middleman here, uh, you know, uh, Jared's talked very effectively about all those uh, processes on the front end, how the manufacturer has increased the price. Sarah talked about the reality is uh, with the testimony in the Senate and the House of uh, pharmaceutical representatives with regard to drug increases that were geometric, 6,000%, uh, and how that is having a significant adverse impact. Now let's look at the distribution market, because I, I, once again, that changes the reality of the process. Because there are three players in the distribution process uh, as we, we look at that. There's third-party administrators, their pharmacy benefit managers, and their stop-loss carriers. It's really interesting when you look at the pharmacy distribution process. We first look at the third-party administrators who basically were, uh, came into being to be claims processors. This was an idea of corporations to outsource, <coughs> excuse me, the claims processing and the TPA began to play the role with regard to processing the claims, managing the claims, uh, especially for self-insured plans, uh, and un underwriting uh, the risk was still the responsibility of the corporation. Because they, the, what happened was the third-party administrators began to expand their role. Uh, they developed provider networks, uh, the fiduciary under the under ERISA was always the company or the company plan, and that ha has been maintained. The plan sponsor is the party that is totally responsible for the plan. And so the TPA makes no medical decisions. They basically work 
in the process of the, the claims movement from source to source. And they, uh, theoretically, they're paid by the company or by the plan on a per employee per month basis. And those numbers are probably in the range of 20 to $25 PEPM for the, for the uh, third party administrator to be the claims processor for the, the company and for the, particularly for the self-insured plan. And that, it plays a, a really interesting role as you look at all of this because as you, I indicated, the ultimate fiduciary for a, for a claim in a self-insured plan is the plan itself. No matter whom they hire, the plan itself and the corporation maintains primary responsibility for that plan. So that's why the self-insured plans develop, uh, uh, sought out, and the insurers develop stop-loss carriers. So the stop-loss carrier, in my mind, is exactly the same as a, a huge deductible because they, in fact, operate in the environment where the company makes a decision. And what's the decision that they make? They make a decision as to what is the sustainable level of uh, loss that they could handle on their medical costs and their pharmaceutical costs. So if a company says that my sustainable level could be a million dollars, if I had a million dollar pharmacy cost, I could handle it out of the benefit plan or out of the corporate uh, ca uh, resources, that would be the point at which they would have a deductible and they would have the stop loss carrier take the loss from that point forward for which they buy insurance. Now, what's interesting about that is the stop loss carriers have determined uh, two ways to, in fact, uh, determine what you want on stop loss care, uh, coverage. You can do it on a specific claim basis. So the company can make a decision with the stop loss carrier that we want coverage for any claim that gets beyond $400,000 and we want coverage for those specific claims. All of the other claims, even if they bang up against our million dollars, we would have to break through and pay the cost above that. And the other way you can buy stop loss care coverage is uh, on an aggregate claims basis where the company makes a different decision. It says I can sustain a million dollars of coverage, but in that circumstance, um, that's in the aggregate. So once my expenses get to $1 million, I want to be in a position where uh, the stop loss carrier uh, takes over to, uh, to cover the cost of those claims. And it's interesting, the stop loss carriers have not played a big role in the process of controlling drug costs uh, they, one of the experts that we know very well has said that they don't see stop loss carriers objecting if the expense of the drug is a 3x the cost of the drug, particularly in the hospital setting. And that becomes interesting because one of the things that we all don't realize, unless we're in this business, that m most not for profit hospitals are defined under the code as 340B enterprises, which means that they buy their drugs at a norm, the norm is wholesale acquisition cost minus 60%. And what this means is, uh, for example, if a drug is costing $100,000 per uh, application, if it's a specialty drug, the likelihood is that the uh, hospital, the not-for-profit hospital, is paying $40,000 for that drug uh, if the wholesale acquisition cost is $100,000. So they had a, have a huge market, margin. We have a consultant at Curis who's an expert in the healthcare field, uh, and 
he has worked at some of the major pharmaceutical companies and he told me that there is a major university hospital <clears throat> that the in the preceding year netted uh, the differential between the wholesale acquisition cost and the drug cost seventy million dollars to their bottom line so when you go to the hospital you face a certain set of of expenses for drugs the 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 hospitals are marking them up significantly in this process i'd like to learn to move to the third part of this process because to me that's the most interesting part of the of the trifold of the middleman the third player is the pharmacy benefit manager <clears throat> and they came they were originally came into existence to create a buying power to reduce healthcare costs and pass the savings on to consumers. Uh, because it was like aggregating a giant network of buyers who could then negotiate with the manufacturers and create an extraordinary value add for the companies that hired the PBM. Because if a, one company had a drug spend of a million dollars and and another company had a drug spend of a million dollars. If you got to an aggregate that there's a group of, of companies that have an aggregate drug spend of a billion dollars, the huge buying power of that, and legally that's called monopsonistic power, the power to drive down costs because you control the market of the people who are buying the product was significant. And that was what was the key for the PBMs, that they were going to be the enterprise that was going to drive down those costs and by doing so, pass on those costs uh, to the consumer or to the company in those circumstances. <clears throat> and then what happened is, as with most businesses, and this is where the issues became, because the drug pricing is so opaque. Uh, and uh, you saw uh, the word cloud at the beginning of this presentation. That was, um, that was a reflection of how opaque the drug pricing was. And I, I liken drug pricing to the airline industry at this point in time. When I get on a plane, if I had to buy a ticket for a flight for tomorrow on a business trip, I may be paying $1,000 for the seat. And the person next to me who's going on a vacation may have purchased those tickets four months ago for $200. So although we're sitting in two identical seats, uh, that person is paying one fifth the cost of what I'm paying. And that's really the, the real issue. The primary responsibility for uh, developing and maintaining a formulary is one of the things that the PBMs developed. They were gonna be the, uh, the gatekeeper of the formulary. And they were gonna negotiate both discounts and they were going to negotiate rebates from the manufacturers. And then they were going to process and pay the prescription costs in this process. And this is particularly important for self-insured plans. And it's interesting in that process, the reality is what happened to the discounting and the rebates. Uh, I think that this will, if you move to ne the next slide, I think it'll tell you uh, a, a little bit, and then I'll cover, I'll cover why this is important. If you take a look at this slide, you see you, uh, three of the biggest uh, PBMs, uh, and look at the numbers. Uh, they paid $7.3 billion in prescribing drug claims, in paying drug claims, and they received from the manufacturers $4 billion in rebates, which means that there's a net outlay of $3.3 billion. I mean, go down the list, and you can see the same thing with Humana at seven minus four uh, really is again, $3 million. And you're seeing the same thing with CVS where, the, where these rebates. So the question is, what is the difference between a rebate and a discount? Because the, the, the PBMs began to negotiate, they initially negotiated uh, discounts. And the discounts actually were passed through directly to the, uh, to the consumers of the drugs, because in that model, the, if the cost was $100 a pill and they negotiated at a discount to $70 a pill, it was clear 
that the number was thirty dollars a pill that people were paying uh, seventy dollars a pill in order uh, for, they were paying rather than a hundred dollars a pill. Whereas in the same example, if the if the rebates became if it became a rebate and it became opaque, the uh, reality is the PBMs began to say, well, this is part of our revenue stream and not part of the pass-throughs that we were going to uh, pass through to the self-insured plans or to the consumers. So the fact is the original idea of the PBM was to maintain responsibility for uh, creating the power to buy and to move patients to uh, less expensive drugs uh, through the process. But the end result is that that's not what really happened because of the opacity of the process. And they are, uh, in fact, dealing with significant dollars. I had an experience uh, with uh, a close friend who was managing a particular corporate, uh, corporation's uh, health care as his portfolio. He's one of my former law partners. And uh, one of the participants online was uh, dealt with us on this as well. And the reality is I asked him through our, our folks, okay, uh, you're spending $600,000 a year in drug uh, uh, expenses, in pharmaceutical expenses. How much are you experiencing in rebates? And he had a quizzical look on his face and he said, what rebates? We don't get any rebates. So we uh, kind of alluded to the fact that maybe the TPA or the PBM, somebody was sharing that revenue stream because they are being negotiated between the manufacturer and those principles in the, in the, in the chain of expenses in the healthcare market. So the reality is when you look at the healthcare market, uh, the, inter the middlemen have d dramatically changed their roles from a focus on saving money for the consumers then the focus of figuring out how they can maximize their returns in the marketplace, despite the fact that their real mission and goal originally was to develop uh, this huge buying power and pass the savings on to the consumers, and in this case, the consumers through the, through the self-insured plans. So that's the story of how the middlemen work, and we'd welcome questions as we move forward. Uh, either trust directly uh, or as we move ahead. Thanks very much, Jared. Great job, Mark. Uh, I appreciate that. It's, it, as you can see, it is not as easy as the drugs manufactured, it's shipped to the pharmacy, the doctor writes the script, then we go pay list price. Um, unfortunately, this is a rude awakening for most of us. And just like anything else in life, the, the more bureaucracy that's in the middle, the more we pay out of pocket. So, however, unfortunately, those aren't the only things at play with costing and price models, okay? We've got some several cost variables that we want to go through quickly that we can leave some time for Q&A here. So, this reminds me of a subject I was horrible at in high school, and that was algebra. But I found this because I love the whole variable thing, but uh, it, it gave me shivers. So, okay. So I alluded to this earlier, well, a trade versus a generic, what, what the heck is the difference? Um, why should I care if I'm on Lipitor or Torvastatin or just give me the drug that works, right? So it's not that easy. So once the manufacturers produce a medication, it's FDA approved and it's, it's uh, what we call an orphan type drug, it's new on the market, then they're, depending upon how long it took them and, and the cost will depend upon how long that drug is going to stay in a trade name like Xarelto okay, or Lipitor, or, you know, fill in the blank. Um, you see so many drug commercials on TV anymore, and they're all trade names for the most part. So once that, those drugs then, those prices are fixed, and there's really not a whole lot we can do about it, other than what Mark was talking about with coupons and rebates. <clears throat> so, however, once that, that uh, legal time has passed, then all the other pharmaceutical companies, and there's quite a few of them out there that, that manufacture meds, they can start manufacturing the biosimilars. So what is a biosimilar? That means that it has, whatever that medication is that actually does its thing, it has to produce that exact same effect, okay? So essentially it's the same medication. So <clears throat> they can't create anything new without the research. However though, 
there's ways to produce these medications at a much lower cost, much more efficiently. And, but what they do is they'll change the additive ingredients. So the additives usually are what causes people to have what we call a quote unquote drug allergy. So some people may have a trade drug, never have a problem with it. Then they finally go generic and it's gonna save them over 300% per bottle of pills. So they go on the generic drug and then all of a sudden they come down with a rash. Oh, you're allergic to Torvastatin. Probably not true. Um, and I recommended this for my family. I just had my wife go last week. Uh, all her life, they said she had a penicillin allergy. And I said, I guarantee you, you don't. She went to the allergy clinic, got tested, and sure enough, she is not allergic to penicillin. And that's a wonderful thing because now instead of all the high dollar meds that they want to put her on, it, next time she gets strep throat or some sort of uh, infection, then that, that's, that's on the formulary for her. So um, I, I just read this. I put it in here. Generics. Generic drugs saved the U.S. healthcare system $265 billion in calendar year 2017. Think about that. So, you know, that, that's the reason why these big pharma companies, they wait so long before, you know, they pay big money in their lawyers, right? But they wait so long before they open it up to um, generics. Another big one that you see all the ads right now, okay, is Viagra. That is, that is a great drug for many different reasons. Um, my favorite time of prescribing it though was for somebody that had pulmonary hypertension. So <laughs> um, it just had an alternative side effect. So it was kind of funny. But anyway, um, you know, you see the hymns and the four hymns and all those other ads out there because now that Viagra is generic, you can get a bottle for 10 bucks, 20 bucks, depending. So that gives you a good idea. Um, otherwise, if you bought straight up Viagra, that was several hundred dollars for just just a, a, a simple sleeve. So, you know, trade versus generics, there, there's huge markups. And I wanna let you know too, I forgot to mention this. On a lot of these slides, you'll see numbers in blue. Um, at the very end of the presentation, and we'll, we'll present this, we'll have this open online. If you wanna to go to cureshealth.com, you'll be able to download a copy of this. Um, there's a reference page. So um, it'd be interesting if I made these up, but I'm not that creative. So these numbers are actual, they're factual numbers. Another variable are kickbacks to providers who prescribe exclusive drugs. Now, we as providers have all you know, sworn to the Hippocratic Oath, we're gonna do the best to not harm our patients in any way. And I believe that price gouging is immoral and unethical. However, I just read an article, um, I attached it to the references, it talked about 40% of specialists, okay, uh, providers that specialize in certain types of medicine are making half of those are making 50% more in their own income based on kickbacks from big pharma. So what does that mean? What, what do they do? So a lot of doctors will promise that they're only going to prescribe a certain drug because they're entered under what we call a clinical trial. And this is long after it's been FDA approved. So what does that mean? It means that at the end of the year, if, if they can show the numbers that they prescribed, you know, Viagra instead of Sladenafil, then they're going to get some sort of uh, major price um, kickback from, from the, the pharma. So that is an issue. It's, it's illegal, uh, but it happens. Um, so anyway, a lot, of, a lot of organizations now aren't even allowing the drug reps to come in anymore. Uh, I remember back when I first started nursing, they'd come up to the floor, they'd hand us sleeves of medications and they'd bring in Olive Garden and all kinds of, you know, little uh, gifts to get us to, to, you know, buy their drugs. And most places have done away with that, but it's still prevalent out there. And, and then these, these big pharma companies will pay for a doctor that you know, heavily prescribes these medications to go do a circuit of speaking. And they'll speak about whatever it is special that they perform, but they make, uh, they make you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year extra just to do that, so. Um, and, I'd, like and to, I'd like to tell you a story about that. Early sure. on, we started Curus, and we had a beta. We had a, a, an individual on a particular a name brand drug that was costing her $100 a month. Our clinical pharmacist who reviews all of our members' records uh, at the outset and continues to review them, called uh, our chief medical officer and indicated that there was a generic that would cost under $5 that had the same uh, exact 
ingredients except for the fillers. And so that would be at around four to four and a half dollars or less than uh, $60 a year. And the, she, she was spending $1,200 a year. So we went and discussed this with the individual because the one thing we cherish at Curis is the uh, patient-doctor relationship. We don't interfere with that, we enhance it. So we, in effect, said, well, would you prefer to have this and have us talk to the physician or not? She said, no, my doctor prescribed the name brand. There must be a reason I will continue on that. And uh, luckily for her, she had the economic resources that it would not impact upon her severely. Yet I was curious about it, so I did some research, and it turned out that that physician was doing a study for that particular pharmaceutical company. So that dovetails completely with what you just said, uh, Jared. Uh, it was a decision made based upon the study and the number of people he had to have on that study, rather than what was in the best interest of the patient at that particular time. That's a great anecdote, Mark, thank you. And imagine if she didn't have the means, right? And she just wholeheartedly trusted her provider to do the best thing for her, right? And she would have been paying out the nose for that, that medication. Exactly. Uh, very interesting, great story. Okay, so let's talk about ways that we can innovate this market and how we can improve the drug costs. And not only improve the drug costs, but let's talk about how we can make our healthcare much more efficient and, and also much more uh, valuable. So one of the solutions we wanna talk about is <clears throat> one of the things that Curis Health has done with, with a, a division of Curis called Curis Health Navigator is we, we've gone through and, and looked at what we call bundled pricing models. Some people will refer to it as reference-based pricing, but this is just slightly different, okay? And so what, what we're looking at is ways to bundle pricing for right now we're, we're heavily concentrated on cancer treatment. So an example would be if, if you need a particular type of drug and you're gonna have to pay for that drug and you're gonna have to pay for the administration of the drug, plus the doctor's fees, the hospital fee, the clinic fee, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've done is we've reached out to what we call centers of excellence and have created a consortium of 16 different centers throughout the nation that have agreed to give us bundled pricing, not a penny more for certain types of cancer and diagnoses and the treatment thereof. Uh, one of the, the cancer treatment centers was able to give us a quote for $65,000 for very expensive pancreatic cancer drug called Lutathera. Lutathera alone initially cost $119,000 per dose just for the drug. That's not including the cost of the, the delivery of the medication, doctor's fees, et cetera, and so forth. So what, what this center of excellence agreed to is if we send them any patients with this particular type of pancreatic cancer, they've agreed 65,000 per treatment, not a penny more. So that gives us that leverage power to say, hey, look, Curis is calling on behalf of this patient. They've got a very serious disease. We're not paying double the price. And if the insurance company won't, won't help us out, then potentially we're going to negotiate with these centers of excellence, get them where they need to be, get them the, the safest treatment possible at the lowest cost possible. And so we're looking to expand upon that, not just cancer centers, but we're going to look for orthopedics. We're gonna look for neurology, GYN, and, and eventually we'd really like to get into the mental health business. So those are some solutions, some innovations that are coming about that we're really excited about and we hope to share some big successes with you in the near future. The next solution that, that we've come up with and, and we've got some partners with the Cures Health Navigator model. Uh, Mark had alluded to this earlier, so I'm not gonna get in it too deep, but I wanna let you know that what this does is that this is a way for us to not wait for those claims to go through the TPA that Mark discussed, that, that the PBM had already approved the drugs. And then at the end of the year, they get to the stop loss carrier and then that carrier realizes, oh boy, this one individual cost us $500,000 this year. How come nobody did anything about it? And then, then their hair's on fire, but it's 10, 11 months too late. So what Health Navigator model is, is that we insert ourselves at the beginning of the process beginning of the chain and, and we're as proactive as possible 
to where we will know exactly when those individuals are diagnosed with one of these major disorders. And we've, we've narrowed it down to five different areas, anything cancer treatment, autoimmune, immunotherapy, hemodialysis, and anybody that's a hemophiliac. So as soon as they're diagnosed with any disorder under those categories or prescribed medications to treat those categories, then they need pre-authorization from Curis Health Navigator before they can move forward. And what that does then is we've identified way up front that this patient is A, they're very sick or soon to be very sick. B, it could be a terminal illness. And C, they're gonna be a huge utilizer, okay? An overutilizer of the healthcare system. And these are the people that can ruin an entire plan. And we've talked about this at great length, but one hemophiliac can shut down your entire insurance plan and you could lose it all. So what we're trying to do is get way ahead of it. And again, we want to offer the very best care possible at the very lowest price possible. The more to come on that too, and we're very excited about Navigator. The next thing we wanna do is we at Curis pride ourselves in our evidence-based pricing models, our evidence-based approach. So what we do is we look at, we'll, let's just say we get a new, a new member and we do their in intake interview and, and we get them all the way through and we, we meet at least once a week as a multidisciplinary team, okay? Everybody is nationally board certified and their areas of expertise, and we'll study the patient, and we'll study their history, their genetics. We'll get to know them intimately, their family, their lifestyle. And what we do then is we compare their current treatment modality with what is the latest evidence out there. What is the research telling us that if we do this, it's going to harm the patient, or if we don't do this, it's going to harm the patient. And then we create a different but parallel treatment modality, and then we can recommend that as needed to their provider and even get them second opinions, referrals, et cetera. So that is a very big part of what we do that, that is driving innovation in, in the United States. Um, we came across an individual that was a hemophiliac and we, we got involved later on. This was a navigator patient. And it, to come to find out that the doctors treating them weren't treating this individual with the latest research with the latest evidence-based pricing. And once we inserted ourselves and said, hey, have we thought about doing this? That was when that patient got a different provider and was prescribed a medication that was about 300% less every year. And he did it so well that he was able to get a knee surgery done that was probably gonna be put off indefinitely. So that's a success story of something that just went through of how evidence-based pricing is an evidence-based practice is the way to go. And so we pride ourselves in that and, and we, we want you to know with Curious Health that, that we are in the know, we're current, and, and we're always looking for that next innovative thing that's gonna save lives. Well, uh, we'd like to thank you all for attending. Uh, this is our first series of three. Our next webinar is gonna be Wednesday, July 24th at noon again, and uh, we will send out some invites. But what we'd like to do is encourage you any comments, questions, uh, recommendations, go ahead and email us, info at curishealth.com. And our number, I'll leave this up here for a few minutes. You can call Mark directly. You can call me directly. We don't mind. There's our phone numbers. But we truly appreciate your attendance. And uh, Curious Hope's